Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning, and I know there are many of you who are out uh, on uh, vacation. We have many families gone uh, during the summertime, but it's encouraging uh, to get together and uh, to sing to the Lord together and to, uh, to spend time with one another, to fellowship with one another, and to learn from His Word. When, uh, before we begin, would you just bow your heads and pray with me? Father, this morning, as, uh, as we gather together, Lord, we're uh, reminded of how good you are. Father, we're reminded of the fact that not only are you our creator, but you are our sustainer, Lord. At every moment, you keep our hearts beating and our lungs breathing. You have orchestrated everything to work together, Lord. And it's by your hand that they hold together. And so, Father, we just want to acknowledge you this morning and thank you for all the ways that you hold us together, that you provide, that you supply, that you protect. We're thankful for these things. And this morning, Lord, we uh, especially want to lift up before your throne, Lord, uh, those who are about the business of spreading your word throughout this world the many missionaries and pastors and elders and teachers and, and uh, disciples all over the world, Lord, who are, uh, who are laboring to spread your, world, many, uh, your word, many of whom are actually enduring persecution, enduring suffering, enduring imprisonment and mistreatment and even death, Father, for the sake of your gospel. We lift them up before your throne. And, Father, we do ask that you give them even more boldness to proclaim your word. And we thank you for them. Lord, this morning we lift up before your throne our country, our leaders, our president, and those who serve in various offices. Lord, we ask that, Lord, you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom, even as you've commanded us to pray for them, Lord, whether we agree with their politics or not, Lord. We ask that you would bless and that you would guide. And Father, we are thankful for the country we live in this morning. We're thankful for the men and women that protect us in our armed forces, Lord. We ask that you would watch over them, that you would protect them, Lord, not just from the enemy, Lord, on this earth, but, uh, Lord, from the enemy of their souls who seeks to destroy them. Father, we ask that you keep them safe, that you draw them to yourself, Lord and that you do protect their families and be with them. This morning, Father, as we uh, are about to dive into your word, Lord, and, and learn the things that you would have for us, Lord, we are mindful that we're all uh, on level footing. We all stand on even ground, Lord, this morning before you because your word, Lord, is our textbook and your Holy Spirit is our instructor and we together are your students, Lord, and so we ask that you would guide us, and Father, more than that, that you would help us to apply the things that you would teach us this morning from your word, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. We have been for some time now in a series entitled, This Changes Everything. And we started this series because we felt as though we had come to a place as a church, as a congregation, where we needed to make some very specific decisions. We needed to outline for ourselves and in our own minds what it is that we are going to be about. What kind of a church are we going to be, you see, because we're truly at a crossroads as a church. And so we began asking some questions, some very basic questions. And it started by asking, what is it that Jesus really wants from me? What is it that Jesus wants from me as a disciple? And we learned in the first uh, message in this series that what Jesus wants is for us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. What that simply means in a, in a summary, in a nutshell, is that he wants us to lay aside our agenda and take up his agenda even to the point of sacrificing our time, 
Even to the point of sacrificing whatever plans we might have for our future, even to the point of sacrificing our material wealth and possessions, and yes, even to the point of physical suffering and perhaps even death, if it's called for. Jesus wants us to take up our cross and follow Him. And it begins by denying ourselves. Next, we learn that the thing that changes everything is obedience. See, because we can stand up here all day and talk about wonderful concepts all throughout this rich book called the Bible, and we do and we should. But I tell you the truth, so many of us as Christians, myself included, spend a tremendous amount of time reading the book and studying things. But you see, it's not the verses or the passages or the scripture text that I don't understand that I have the difficulty with. The passages that I have the most difficulty with are the ones that I do understand. Because you see, Jesus is calling us to something so different, so radical, so far removed from the world in which we live that we look at and we say, can that really be what he wants from us? Is that that really the thing? Is that really the deal? And so we've come to the point where we have to admit We have to admit that the only thing that's really going to change anything is obedience. Not just talking about it, not just reading it, not just theorizing, not just philosophizing, but actually doing it. See, that's the catch. That's the hard part. And then, in the next message in that series, we spoke about the practical power of prayer because you see, if we as a church are going to do anything, if we're going to accomplish anything or go anywhere, it will only be as the Holy Spirit changes hearts and minds and does a supernatural work here in this community so that we can reach the lost for Christ. Without prayer, it's impossible. We cannot do battle in the spiritual realm with physical things. It just doesn't work. And so we have to get on our knees and we have to pray and we have to beseech and we have to ask the Lord to do a work here. And then, last week, or rather, actually Harold spoke last week because I was gone, but the weeks prior we spoke about, we spoke about the radical results of relational evangelism. The radical results of relational evangelism because through relational evangelism, through a lifestyle of meeting people and sharing the truth of the gospel with them, that is the only way we're going to get the gospel to penetrate into every corner of this community. And so that's where we left off last time. This week, this week, this morning, we're going to talk about the discipline of discipling. The discipline of discipling. Why is it that we're talking about that of all the things we could be talking about? Well, first we talked about what it takes to follow Jesus. We talked about the fact that we have to obey in order to do it. Then we talked about the fact that nothing happens without prayer. Then we talked about the fact that we have to do a relational evangelism. The very next thing we have to do is talk about after we've done a relational evangelism, after we've like gone out and spread the gospel and shared it with people, what do we do next? I mean, is it enough to just, to just maybe throw out a couple of tracts out there? Nothing wrong with tracts, by the way. But is it, is it enough to just throw out a tract, to just tell someone about Jesus and then walk away and hope that they somehow figure it out or get it? You see, according to Jesus, it was not enough. Because Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, he says, look, I want you to follow me, to come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. To be fishers of men simply means rather than catching fish, you catch people. Not for your own sake, but for Christ. And so this morning, I want to speak with you briefly about the discipline of discipling. And here's why. Because you see, if New Hope is going to be a healthy church, if New Hope is going to grow, if New Hope is going to impact this entire city with the gospel of Christ, it is critical that we develop the discipline of discipling, each one of us. You need, I need, all of us need to be 
in discipling relationships. And what that simply means is this. It means that we should either be discipling someone and at the same time, someone should be discipling us. We should be discipling someone and someone should be discipling us. Now the question certainly comes up at this point. How do we do that? What does that mean? What does it even look like? What is, what is discipling? I mean, I can, I can kind of get discipleship. That means kind of becoming like Christ. But what is discipling? And the answer is this. And I want to begin with uh, 1 Corinthians 4. 14, if you'd read with me. 1 Corinthians 4, 14, the Apostle Paul says, look at, this, look at this example here. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but rather to admonish you as my beloved children, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me, And that is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. But some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in the spirit of gentleness? You see, here is a, is a perfect example of Paul's discipling others. You see, Paul, the Apostle Paul, had no personal agenda. He had no uh, uh, plans outside of that which Christ had for him. Paul was not interested in accomplishing whatever he thought would be most beneficial to him. The Apostle Paul was a servant and viewed himself as nothing. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 and following. Paul saw himself as a lowly servant. He was considered and he considered himself to be the scum of the world. And it was precisely this attitude which made him the discipler that he was. You see, because in order to be a discipler, in order to disciple another person, you have to be willing to give yourself away. You have to be willing to step out of yourself and give yourself away. If you're going to have an impact on other people, it's all about giving your life up for someone else. Now, I want to get practical with you this morning. I want to just briefly run through with you, if I may, six basic components that we find in this passage we just read. In the life of Paul, these six components that are critical to our relationship as disciplers. We have to incorporate these components in order for our discipleship procedure to be effective. And I'll just share them with you in order as we see them in the text. First, first, you have to make disciples. If you're going to be a disciple or if you're going to disciple another man or another woman, you have to make a disciple. That's the beginning. You have to reproduce yourself and disciple someone. It starts when they become a Christian because you shared the gospel with them. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. That means it's your responsibility to do so. It's not an option. It's not a question. We don't have to decide whether or not we should do it, whether or not I don't feel led, I don't feel called. You know, it's not my thing. We're called to do it, every one of us as Christians. No compromise. We have to first make disciples. Two, we have to love the disciples that we make. Paul, as you see, loves these people. You can read it in the text. In 2 Corinthians 12, 15, Paul says, I will most gladly be spent and spend for your souls. 
He wasn't, he wasn't concerned with what it would cost him, with what price he would pay, with whether his stuff would get dirty, with, with whether he, or not he would lose some possessions or lose some of his time or lose some money. He wasn't concerned with that. He was concerned with loving them. See, when you love someone, like when you love your kids, you don't ask, well, how much is this going to cost or what's, what's going to happen here? What's it going to take out of my life? You know, these kids are just draining my time and my money. You don't ask that. Because they're your kids, and so you love them. Paul loved the people he was discipling. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own, catch this, also our own selves, because you had become so very dear to us. Paul says he's not just willing to share the gospel, he's willing to share himself. That means everything he is, everything he owns, everything he has. Galatians 4.19, My little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Do you see how much he loved them? See, when they were starting to slip, he was, he was in anguish, just like our kids. And then thirdly, we see that Paul admonishes admonishes those whom he is discipling to be like Christ. He admonishes them. To admonish simply means to warn. If you're going to be a spiritual father, there must come admonishment. It's just like being a father at home. You bring your children into the world, you lavish them in love, but there also comes a time to admonish them, to warn them. 1 Corinthians 4.14 says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Colossians 1.28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. See, we have to admonish, we have to warn. And this means understanding where the person that you're discipling may be struggling. Understanding what it is that they're wrestling with. What sin are they maybe involved in? Is there a besetting sin in their life? You have the job of exposing that. They need to come to the place where they can speak to you about that, where they can be open, where they can be accountable. It's the father's loving responsibility to his children. You know, one of the tragedies that we read in the Old Testament is Eli and his wicked sons. And if you've read that story, you understand what's happening there. When you sum it up, the problems of Eli, the high priest, were his wicked sons who were committing fornication outside the door of the temple where their father was, he was the high priest. They were wicked, wicked men. And the sum of it all is in 1 Samuel 3, 13, where it says, Eli did not restrain his children. Isn't that interesting? This is the whole problem. This is what happens. He didn't restrain them. Galatians 6, 16, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So we're not trying to crush them. We're not trying to crush the spiritual child. What we're trying to do is warn them. Warn them. And effective discipling involves admonishing. Number four. And this, by the way, is the one that ties them all together. Without this, all the others fall apart. Anyone who is an effective discipler, not only begets other disciples, not only loves them, not only admonishes them, but fourthly, he must, he must, she must, he must set an example. You must set an example. Not with your talk, not with your words, not with your mouth, with your life. 1 Corinthians 4.16, I urge you then be imitators of me, 1 Corinthians 11 one says, Be imitators of me, even as I imitate Christ. Can you imagine saying that to someone? 
Can you imagine right now walking up to a friend of yours and saying, listen, would you, would you imitate me as I imitate Christ? Whew, that's pretty heavy duty, isn't it? Doesn't that just like bring up all kinds of thoughts? Boy, I better get this squared away and that put away and this fixed. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. You see, you pattern your life Paul says, exactly after me because I'm patterning my life exactly after Christ. There's the heart of it. There is the real integrity that must be there in discipling. Without it, all the other principles fall apart. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no one despise you for your youth, Paul says, but set the believers an example in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. You see, he's telling Timothy something. He's telling, telling him, look, you can't just go up there on a Sunday morning and preach a wonderful sermon. You've actually got to live it. And the people that are closest to you must see that you're living it. When you disciple someone... What you're really doing is going alongside them, walking side by side with them like this on the road, arm in arm, and they are watching you. They're watching you. They see how you act. They see what kind of words you use and what kind of look you have on your face when a tough situation arises. When that guy cuts you off in traffic, how do you respond? How do you react? See, that's what they're looking for. That's what they want to see. Philippians 4, 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things. Can you say that to someone you're discipling? Can you say, look, whatever you've learned from me and received from me and heard from me, the things you observe in my life, if you would just do that, you'll be great. Whew, that's tough. We've got to lead by example. Number five. No one's going to live a godly life without sound theology. You know, it is interesting, it is interesting that I've heard people say something to the effect of, you know, well, why are you, why are you all into, you know, this theology and this deep stuff, you know, you like to study and all that. Listen, folks. I get no more encouragement from anything than I do from theology, than from understanding who God is and what His Word says and learning truth. It gives me such encouragement and it teaches me how I can react to situations and how to live, you see. So if you are going to disciple someone, if you're going to be in the business of discipling, you've got a responsibility to teach you must teach, not just by your way of life, but with your mouth. Paul says that I teach everywhere, that which I teach everywhere in every church. Paul know, knew that there's no discipling without teaching. Because all, and here's why, because all of our living Everything we do and everything we think is built around our belief system. Do you understand that? Everything you do, the way you act, the decisions you make, your constant choices are a simple reflection of your belief system. It's real easy. Whatever you believe, that's the filter you process everything through. So if you're going to make a decision... Am I going to do this? Am I going to cheat on my income taxes? Am I going to get into a promiscuous relationship with a gal? Am I going to whatever the chances, the choices are? You filter it through your belief system. And if you believe the Word of God and it has control over you, then God has control over your life, you see. Acts 20:28 20, says, "For I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel 
of God. You see, teaching is at the heart of it. You ever heard the saying, you are what you think? It's true. The way you think, that's what you are, that's who you are. What goes on in your mind in terms of belief and conviction is the thing that will control the future of your life. And number six, if you're going to disciple someone, a good discipler is one who is committed to discipleship and does one other thing. You must discipline. You must discipline. You know, you get to the point in many relationships where you can say to yourself, okay, I've admonished this person. I've loved them. I've taught them not only in word, but by example. I've done all of these things. And we've just simply got a wayward child here. And there is a battle because we fear sometimes we'll push people away. But listen to the Apostle Paul's answer to this. Listen to this. It'll help you. 1 Corinthians 4, 8. He says this. Some of you are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of those arrogant people, but their power, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? You see, every good discipler carries with him a rod. Every good discipler carries a rod. I don't mean a physical rod. What I mean is this. What is the rod that we're talking about? The rod is Matthew 18. If your brother sins, go to him. You've heard that, right? Confront him. If he doesn't repent, what are you supposed to do? Take what? What do you do? Take a witness. That's right. That's right. You take a witness. If he doesn't listen to the witnesses, what do you do then? You bring him where? For the church. That's right. You see, this is a process. This is the process of bringing the rod. And if he doesn't repent after you bring him to the church, then you put him out. See, that's the rod. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 says, I turned him over to Satan so he can learn not to blaspheme. See, if he doesn't repent, it's real easy. You just separate yourself from him. It says you don't even eat with him. You confront him about his sin. You admonish him about it. But the rod is that you separate. That's the rod. If you're going to be a discipler, a disciple maker, you have to be willing to use all six of these tools. It's not much different than the parenting process. And I want to wrap it up to you in this way by reading verse 17. Listen to this. Here is the fruit of it. Here's the result of it. Here's what he says in 17. For this reason, in order to continue to disciple you, catch the word there, in order to continue to disciple you, and to bring you where need, you need to be. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy. Now let's stop right there. You may say to yourself at this point, wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> if you're so serious about this, if you're so, uh, if you're so concerned with the way that they're acting, why don't you like, take the time to come yourself? Why are you sending Timothy? If this is so important to you, why would you do that, Paul? Here's why. And you've got to catch this. This is really important. What he's saying is this. 
You're so messed up. You've got so many sins. You've got so many issues you need to work through. I'm so grieved over you and my heart is so broken over you that I'm so distressed over you that I'm sending you Timothy to come to you. Why would you send Timothy, Paul? Here's why. I've sent you Timothy, verse 17, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of what? Of my ways. Did you catch it? Timothy, whom I'm sending to you, will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ. What's the point? Here's the point. He sent Timothy because Timothy... Timothy imitated Paul as Paul imitated Christ. He, Paul, reproduced a disciple like himself through the process, through the process of dis- discipling. Paul, of all people, understood the discipline of discipling and he made it his life's goal. Paul was constantly discipling someone. Jesus said this, when a man is fully discipled, he'll be like his teacher. Do you want to make your life count? Do you like want to make a difference? Do you want to be about doing the business of the Lord's work, building his kingdom? Here's what he wants you to do. No question, no doubt, no choice. You must become, you must become a disciple maker by learning the discipline of discipling. Because we need to spread the message of Christ, not just in word, but in deed. And this is how Christ chose to do it. Not by some guy standing up on front of a pulpit talking to a congregation. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want the rubber to really meet the road, you want your life really to change, because see, you'll walk out of here, and whether you say, oh, that guy's terrible or that was a decent sermon, it doesn't really matter, because you're going to forget it in about 15 minutes. But you see, if you walk with somebody that's discipling you, if you make yourself accountable to someone who's discipling you, then everything changes. And as you begin discipling others, their lives change. Because this is what God has called us to do as a church. Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful for the fact that, Lord, you you gave us a means by which to reach people. You gave us a means by which to teach people people about your life, not just in words, Lord, but you gave us the means of discipling, whereby we ourselves can grow in Christ by coming under someone who is more mature than we are and learning how to follow you as they follow you. And Father, you've also given us the responsibility of taking men and women under our wing and discipling them, showing them, Lord, not just in word, but in action, what a disciple really looks like. Thank you, Father, for this privilege. Thank you for this responsibility. Father, I would ask right now that every person sitting in this room, every person listening to the sound of my voice on the Internet, every person listening to this message, would decide here and now, would decide today that they are going to make themselves accountable to someone who will disciple them and that they themselves will be about the business of discipling others for your namesake, for your glory, so that your will can be done. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.